Good morning. My name is Lenka Fedorkova, and I'm the Vice President for Business Development and Strategic Alliance Management at the Harrington Discovery Institute. I'm delighted to introduce the upcoming panel session, creating a value proposition that attracts investment. You have heard from various scholars how drug discovery expertise from our managers and advisors has influenced the trajectory and success of their programs. Advancing early stage discoveries into medicines that ultimately make a difference in people's lives takes a village. There are many facets to developing a new therapeutic, including answering questions such as how the patient should receive the new treatment, where is the therapeutic positioned in the market, or what should the payment and reimbursement strategy look like. In this session, you will hear from members of the Harrington Investment Advisory Board, or IAB. The IAB members, who are experienced investors, will share their perspectives about how they advise and help shape the scholar programs so that we add maximum value and help meet critical milestones that in turn attract industry interest and additional funding. Moderating this session will be Becca Braun, a longtime consultant to the Harrington Discovery Institute with a background in business, nonprofit leadership, and innovation. Now I'll turn it over to Becca. Thank you. Thank you, Lenka. I will indeed be moderating our panel. And I am thrilled to be in the presence of such a brilliant and driven audience and amidst these leaders on our panel. Graham, John, and Jesse have shown profound dedication and commitment to the national and international resourcing of drug discovery and development. I'll offer my own warm welcome to our panelists by introducing them. First is Graham Martin. Hi, Graham. How are you? Good, I'm good. to be here. For four decades, Graham has <clears throat> had international pharma and biotech R&D experience. In 2017, he founded Hatchbox Bioconsulting, which offers guidance to life sciences innovators. He previously was CEO of Takeda Ventures, the venture arm of Takeda Pharmaceutical, where he oversaw investments in early stage biotech companies and served on many companies' boards. He's held senior R&D positions at Roche, Glaxo Welcome, and Welcome Research Laboratories, and he has his bachelor's from, in pharmacology from the University of Bath and his doctorate from University College. His international experience and skill sets offer tremendous insight and breadth in life sciences. Welcome to Graham. And next is John Rice. Hi, John. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, John is our IAB chairman and he's managing director at Cincitech, a venture development organization where he also leads the life sciences practice. He is co-founder and prior manage, managing partner of Triathlon Medical Ventures. And previous to that, he had 26 years of biomed research and R&D management experience at Battelle and SenMed. He has been chairman, CEO, founder, or observer at many life sciences companies. And he serves on the advisory boards of Cincy Children's, Case Western, Cleveland Clinic, and elsewhere. He has his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate in microbiology and virology from The Ohio State University. And I know from my own years in the Ohio innovation world that in the view of many, John is the father of biomed investing and resourcing in Ohio. And third is Jesse True. He is the founding, oh, hi, Jesse. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi, He's Becca. Founding partner of Domain Associates. He has been the director of 38 early stage healthcare companies, over 20 of which are public. He has been founder and or executive at numerous early stage life sciences companies, much larger life sciences companies, and top performing venture funds. He has his bachelor's in physics from Rensselaer Polytechnic and his physics master's and doctorate from Princeton. Today, he's the chairman and CEO of Stellar Energy Foundation, which is a fusion energy company intending to impact climate change. He has for decades been a committed leader investing in and partnering with cutting edge biomed solutions and innovators across the US. So welcome to you three. And without further ado, I would like to start us off with questions. Around halfway through or thereabouts, I'm hoping that you in the audience will ask lots of questions to make my job today a cakewalk and make their job difficult. <laughs> if you have a question, you should see on your screen that you can go to slido.com and enter pound sign symposium 22 with a capital S as the password. So hopefully that's up on your screens today. And for the first question, I will direct it to Jesse. Uh, Jesse, what key factors do you consider when evaluating projects and programs for the Harrington Discovery Institute? 
Wow, that's <clears throat> that's a complicated question with um, the possibility of a simple answer. So in thinking about this panel, I reflected on what we do in the professional venture side of selecting projects. And um, there are at least 14 different parameters that a professional VC looks at before picking a project. I could recite them to you, but it would put the audience to sleep. For the Harrington project selection, it gets somewhat simpler because we are entirely focused on filling the early stage funnel of projects in biotech and biofarm with promising technologies that could have a major impact on patients' health and well being. And our key, not only, but our key success factor when we gauge ourselves at Harrington is did the project result in the project getting to the next step? By which we usually mean, did it get licensed to a larger company? Okay. John or Graham, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, keeping it, you know, fairly simple, you know, as, as Jesse pointed out, as professional VCs, there's a lot of things we look at. Um, and a lot of those things don't exist at the stage of the companies or the opportunities that we're seeing at the Harrington. And so a, a lot of what we do is apply our experience, but at the end of the day, very often we're making somewhat subjective judgments. Is the, is the not technology better and different? Uh, does it have the potential to get to the next step? Does it matter to the people who are gonna be picking it up after we do? And that goes into a lot of the discussion and debate that we have when we're reviewing different projects for funding. Mm. I think I can really only um, reiterate what uh, Jesse and John have just said. I mean, from my perspective, there are a number of stages that any sort of uh, medical innovation is likely to have to travel. Uh, and that, in my head, and very simplistically, is from concept through proofs of concept, usually, obviously, preclinically, uh, but ultimately clinically, uh, and then advancing that asset um, or that, that potential medicine through a number of steps that will make it um, commercially appealing. So whilst we always like to talk about providing medicines for patients who need them, uh, there are practical constraints in actually getting those medicines to patients that include how commercially viable that idea is. So <clears throat> whenever I'm looking at something that is essentially conceptual or going through proof of principle in early stage science, I'm already looking at these downstream questions about the tractability of, of a process required to move that medicine towards the clinic. And obviously, that's not the end of the story. We have to get it into the, harm, uh, into the hands of uh, <clears throat> a commercial enterprise that can obviously develop and market that, that drug as well. So all of these things, um, I think, weigh into uh, an evaluation of, of science, even at the earliest stage. Yeah, Becca, you know, the question you ask is, is close, but not the same as what's the thought process that an academic researcher goes through in deciding what field to focus on. So does an academic researcher think, should he or she think about how big a pool of grant money would be needed to tackle a given project. So, and I've never been in the academy, but I wonder whether the academic researchers give any thought at all to the idea that, oh, gee, I have a great idea for such and such a disease, but I know that I'm going to have to figure out how to get grants totaling $18 trillion and that's not going to happen. Or I know that, now this is a zinger, I know that reimbursement's been really hard to get for such and such other disease for which I have a great scientific idea. Does that researcher 
steer away from that because of the challenge or not? So these are some of the things that a professional VC, and even at the Harrington Investment Advisory Board, we will touch on those things when we talk about projects. We will touch on difficulty of development. We'll touch on reimbursement and, and regulatory issues. We certainly focus on the attractiveness for M&A, and that's very much a, a fad, a changeable fad environment. So it's a pretty complicated question, Becca. Sure. Is, um, is 18 quadrillion the technical term in your world? <laughs> How many zeros? Tell me about, um, about the um, different viewpoints each of you brings or bring to the table in these meetings. You have specialized areas of interest to some extent and expertise and background and you know, you know where the bodies are buried in terms of what you're, you, you, you've, you've suffered with. So can you each talk a little bit about when you're in one of these meetings, um, looking at a, a possible uh, way to resource a company, what does each of you, you know, take us into an actual meeting. What does Graham bring? What does Graham bring up? What does John reliably bring up? What does Jesse bring up? I'd we share, so I we should talk them. about the other guy or yeah. they're going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> you could do that. So, you know, you, we should point out that there are three other members to this uh, investment advisory board. So you have three venture investors here with industry background and, and, and so forth. And we have also an, an entrepreneur who has started a company and sold a company and started another company, a scientific founder. And we have an academic who has been in history and academia. Um, and we have uh, another physician scientist. Uh, on the, you know, so everybody has those backgrounds that they, they bring to bear and they bring sort of those perspectives, but are not shy about shot, you know, straying beyond that because we kind of have been across the, the spectrum of experiences. So when I'm looking at something, the first thing I think about is the competition. You know, who else is trying to do this and how are we better or different than that? So that's kind of where I'm spending my time and, and asking questions if it hasn't been articulated to us when we hear a presentation for, for funding. And, and, and Jesse and, and Graham may have other perspectives as well. Yeah, I, I think my, my starting point with my background, which is largely uh, the pharmaceutical industry, um, you know, I started my life professionally with a white coat on doing lab research. So I've done drug discovery. I, I know and I, I understand how complex and difficult it is to come up with a new, uh, you know, a new idea and then, and then attempt to prosecute it. So at the end of the day, I'm looking at the credibility of the science, obviously the credibility of the scientist trying to drive that science forward. But I'm also sort of asking the question from the beginning, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, about what does industry want? And uh, I would like to think that I'm still current enough to be able to understand what a dialogue with uh, an industry peer or business development team and industry might might uh, might look like, and so trying to sort of frame guidance that we provide within those contexts, I think, can be enormously valuable to someone who has not experienced uh, that that side of the equation. Yeah, for sure. Tell me about. Um, uh, we know that you know there's you bring tremendous value in helping. Uh, 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 move these uh, projects along in the ecosystem. Why should a researcher? You've sat on. You've all sat on so many of these, so many advisory boards and whatnot. Why should they put Harrington Discovery Institute specifically high on their list of places from which they want to get funding? What you want to start, and, Jesse? Oh yeah, man, um, sure. We'll go to Jesse again. The, 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 <laughs> the, the, the Harrington process. If you get a grant from Harrington. You don't get just money. You get a whole team of people that are going to link arms with you and help brainstorm about all the things <clears throat> that the project needs to advance. And um, there is a team of people at Harrington that have real drug experience, drug development experience, and they are your teammates. You will have work sessions with them. And they are going to be suggesting to you, why don't you 
do animals of this species? Why don't you do this animal model? Why don't you do that animal model? You know, in this case, the animal model isn't going to teach you very much. So why don't we just go right out to CMC? These kinds of really helpful, and they're not out to get you. They're motivated to have the project succeed. They want the project to work. They're measured by how many projects work. Um, I don't think there's any other organization in the world that offers that. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned, so, uh, John, tell us about um, the uh, protection of intellectual property. Okay, and so, first of all, two questions related to intellectual property. One is, does Harrington Discovery Institute take rights to intellectual property? And two is, regardless, when should a researcher uh, begin to seek uh, IP rights on their very early stage discovery? So the first first question, does, uh, does Harrington take any rights? No. So you know, we're pretty unique in, the, in, in, in that regard in an organization that's advancing a, an idea toward commercialization. We don't take IP rights. They reside with the inventor, the innovator, or their institution, most likely. And, and we go to great lengths to protect that. So, you know, we are all under confidentiality. All of our meetings are, are private, including this symposium. So that's a point you should be aware of. So we're, we're highly sensitive to that because IP is critical to moving forward. You have to have, you know, IP patent protection by and large to get investors or uh, big pharma interested in your opportunity because they want the proprietary rights to that for their business. And so in, to that end, you know, you know, you you probably have already, if you if you by the time you come to us, thought about IP and, and filed patents, et cetera. One of the contributions of the TDC um, is to Just explain help. what the TDC is. So that's the therapeutic development team that 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 helps you. That Jesse described the Diana Wetmore leads. So you know, part of the advice they give is not on how just to develop your drug, but how to develop your IP. And, and in many of the projects that have come into Harrington, there has been new IP developed with the you know the advice from the TDC. You know, and we don't take ownership any of that either. We may be an event, you know contributing inventor potentially, but we don't do that. So that's that's highly critical. Yeah. And, and I would just add to this equation too the fact that you know a lot of the motivation for an academic is in securing grant money. And in order to secure grant money, you have to publish. And there is a circularity that's potentially dangerous here because once you start to encroach upon your intellectual property, you run the risk of creating prior art against your own invention. And that neutralizes the whole value proposition for that for that early stage inventor. So I think there's very important learnings that uh, Harrington can bring to scholars to allow them to recognize and draw the line between, I'm doing science because I'm passionate about the science, but I'm not doing it for science's sake. I want to create a medicine out of this. And these, these two worlds actually are fundamentally different from one another. And, and uh, you know, one is highly commercial and the other is, is not. Uh, and so the, the needs and demands on the individual create a bit of a schism at that point. But I think this is where HDI, as, Jerry, uh, as Jesse said earlier, um, is one of the unique uh, organizations that I can, I think can provide this level of advice of advice at this critical early stage in pioneering innovation. So that's yeah. a very important principle. I'll, ju I'll just remark, um, because I'm old enough to remember when times were very different. I remember the time when no self-respecting biomedical researcher would go near anything that smacked of commercialization. And then Genentech happened. And flash forward 40, 50 years, now no self-respecting biomedical researcher would walk down the hallway, go to a cocktail party without being able to talk about his or her startup that came from her lab. That's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so, Graham, I want to uh, stay with you on a topic of um, just moving into specifically that area of academia, academic medical centers. 
Uh, and a couple of things in that area I'd, I'd like to cover. And then while you are, while you uh, gentlemen are answering a couple of these questions, I am going to be looking to the side a little bit to see our, our questions from the audience. So uh, don't mind me while I do that. But um, the first thing is, um, uh, what are, you referenced the uh, prior publishing and that that can be a problem for prior art type of thing, but what are the most challenging aspects of creating uh, university or academic medical spinoffs? That's one area that's challenging. What else? And then I want to also ask about, uh, you know, sort of percentage of, um, of, of, of drug discoveries that, uh, uh, commercialized drugs that come from academia, but I'm going to ask about that in a second. Well, I, you know, I'm... <laughs> John is probably the better person to address that question than I am. I, I, um, I've i spent a lot of my life, of course, on the commercial side of, of what we do in, in medical uh, discovery. Um, but I have worked with academic institutions quite a bit. I have witnessed the sort of transformation Jesse alluded to between, um, you know, organizations who wouldn't touch industry money with a barge pole, dirty money, don't want any of that too. We need to forge uh, very clear triumvirate uh, relationships between academia, the industry and financial uh, institutions who can support that. And you've seen a number of examples of that, uh, I think, grow over the last few years. While I was at Takeda, for example, we created, um, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it was the Tri-Institutional Therapeutic Discovery Initiative, which was a three-way combination. I, and I, I'm going to forget everybody that was involved in this, but I believe it was Rockefeller, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and Cornell. I believe those were the three academic institutions that came together with Takeda support, financial as well as material, in order to do many of the things that we've been talking about today, which is advancing early stage academic innovation through a path that is commercially uh, relevant and, and uh, clearly commercially viable. But I think on, a, on another scale, John, you probably have more experience than I do in, in addressing that question. Well, I had posed a question to each of you, and I'll see what, what Jesse thinks, but you know, what proportion of our portfolio, and most of my portfolio are startup companies? And the vast majority of the startup companies in drug development, biotech, et cetera, have their origins in, in academic medical researchers. So there is a there's a whole art to the process of creating a company out of a university spin out the usual requirements for novelty and, and so forth. And then there's the navigation of the relationship with the institution and getting licenses back and forth. And, and Jesse and I have a couple that we've actually been together over the decades that have been successful. You know, you may want to relate some of that, Jesse. You were closer to the, pulling it out the doors of Duke and so forth. <clears throat> yeah, I, I would say most most of biotech comes from academia. So so it's it's a well trod path at this point, yeah. um, and and there are there are best practices which. Some people are better at than others. And, and on our end, we're always complaining and, and probably on the founders' ends of companies complaining about dealing with their institutions, but they have gotten far more sophisticated and engaged uh, in the process as well. They don't always, it's, not always, always, it's a negotiation like anything else. So they're, they're trying to get as much value as they can from the IP that their inventors have created. And we're trying to maximize the value that we create, but you know, it works. Obviously there's lots of companies being created and there are, you know, at some points, equity and royalty payments being made back to these institutions based on the success of these companies. In some cases, indeed. Jesse, do you, you said most, um, most. Oh, uh, oh only because I'm not, I'm, most, I'm just not confident enough to say a hundred percent, but it's, it's gotta be up in the nineties. I, I, you know, that's, that's okay. what I think. And so most commercial medicines today, uh, just just to clarify, because I, I didn't realize that most would have had their origins in academic research, although it makes sense. But um, you're talking about commercial medicines would have their. Well, and, and you may see commercial medicines, you know, that are big sellers now that have a 20 year history that began back at university. Maybe they acquired a company that had you know, that had been created around it, or maybe they struck a deal with that investigator. But by and large, you know, the, the creativity for most new medicines is coming out of academia. Yeah, yeah. And, and you asked what about the what's the hardest part of, of doing a startup from a university? Um, the most typical startup problem is the length of time required to negotiate the terms of the license with the tech transfer people. 
Yep. There are varying degrees of urgency between investors and founders on one side and the institutions on the other. They're not, they're not always built for speed. Is it length of time only, or is it also other factors that go into making it a great length of time? You know, there, there's probably dozens, but at the end of the day, that's the one that, you know, we all yeah. think about and remember. Yep. Yep. What, what is the length of time? Six months, a year, something like that. You can okay. go quick. You know, some folks are very quick and very facile and can do it quickly. It just depends on, on the motivation and, and how the institution thinks about wanting to do startups. Some are more oriented to that than others. Absolutely. We have a question directed at uh, Graham. So here we go. Uh, Graham Martin, during your years with pharma, did you see a shift in how pharma assesses potential technologies, such as the acceptable level of risk? Acceptable level of risk. Yes. I mean, it, it, it's a little bit of a cyclic pattern that pharma goes through. Um, and, and, and what it dictates where they are at any one time is, is dependent on a number of factors like capital markets, how much cash they have available to spend in the outside world, their own level of confidence in internal discovery. But there's no doubt that I think we are right now in the middle of uh, a trend for pharma to insource uh, its innovation. It does it at all stages, by the way, but you know, relevant to our discussion today, there is no doubt in my mind that pharma is, is uh, actually pretty enthusiastic about both forging relationships. There could be R&D collaborations, for example, that result in the generation of innovation or IP. But if it already exists, they are, they are increasingly bold with, uh, I think, the, the, the desire to take on a lot of the risk from a very early stage. So it's all about securing competitive advantage through something that's innovative and differentiated before your competitors do. So the earlier you go, the better the probability of success. Good. Um, and how about, is there, um, John, is there a certain threshold of funding that investors like to see behind a technology that they support? No, I don't think there is. It's ultimately how, you know, what is the novelty, differentiated features of it, all, all the things we've been talking about here, you know, and it, that could be somebody has a, a great idea that has not reduced it to practice. That's harder than if somebody's actually got to reduce it to practice a little bit. But, um, you know, there's not some threshold number. In, in experience, it's probably been multi -year, multiple years of grant funding that has got to some point, but we don't, that's not a checkbox that we have. Yeah, so it's it's a it's a stage. Well, then let's talk about um, let's talk about the uh, the stage, the uh, the specific. And we started out a little bit with this, but still, can you get a little more specific on the the stage that you uh, that you want to see? Let's talk about. Um, I'm just thinking whether we want to talk about that. We a little bit talked about it at the beginning for Harrington Discovery Institute when you're on the uh, on the IAB. What stage you like to see? But how about in venture? when you're actually, when you're, you know, assessing it for a venture uh, investment? In, in, in my practice, in, in, in my firm, which is a seed investment firm, we create companies and invest in the first institutional rounds. So we invest in projects that look very much like Harrington projects. Probably the biggest difference, and, and every venture capitalist will tell you this, is, is their management. So, you know, we invest as much in the people that are going to be building the business or, or advancing the project as we do in the technology. The technology has to be high quality and so forth. But, you know, we need to have know that there's some steward of our money and we engage in either helping people find those that management team or vetting and, and evolving that management team if we put our money in. But we go in at, at this stage and, and you know, I have in my portfolio companies that are pre proof of concept, you know, because the it's so novel. You know, that we're going for novelty and differentiated. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, and that's, that's Cincy Tech because it is, it is so early stage, right? Um, would domain or triathlon or anything be any different? I, I, my, my reaction is it ebbs and flows. Um, there are periods of time when pharma tends to want to do deals only with companies that are in phase two clinical trials. Then there are times when pharma is opening their pocketbooks from a much earlier stage. Um, but it's harder than just picking up BioWorld and reading about what deals are being done and saying, okay, that's me. 
uh, I'm going to go get venture capital because there's a, then a lag time before the senior leadership of pharma catches up. And so you're sort of always chasing the yeah. rabbit or something but <laughs> are you though are you though yeah. your tail or you know what are you chasing <laughs> yeah i've been there not in pharma but other yeah. other fields <laughs> yeah but but you see that's that's makes uh, professional venture investing a little harder because the investor group has that same challenge uh we've had funds at domain where we strategically said we're not going to touch anything that's preclinical um but that ran the risk of of winding up with a portfolio that was too late stage and we missed all the really hot blockbuster early stage things yeah, then and, you see and then vice versa go public who was preclinical and successful and you say okay we're only going to do preclinical <laughs> yeah I, I i think the overarching truth is that an absolute blockbuster new technology will trump stage every time yeah yeah uh, well, uh, two questions based on what you both said, and then I have another question from the audience. But first, uh, I'm going to get back to that blockbuster stage that you mentioned. But John, you uh, uh, talked about um, the management teams. How can a researcher stay involved uh, with their technology, their discovery, as it moves along in the ecosystem with multiple stakeholders and participants? That's always, you know, the... the um, um, you know, they they have to want to do that. They have to articulate. You know, I want to be part of this and 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 learn how this works and and support it. So, so any way they can be supportive, you know, to the technology, um, is is going to be important to advancing it. Um, but you know, beyond that, you know, they have to cultivate the relationship with the, with the other folks that are coming together around the project and kind of find their niche. Um, you know, in general. You know, the founding scientists don't don't become management team members, but there's always exceptions to all of that. And then and very often they don't want to do that. It's a very different en endeavor than than what they've been doing in the past. So you know, it, it, we have experiences both ways with it. Should but, they know the, that clearly before we, they approach anybody, what the, role they want or should they be open to? You know, what, what would well, they should, you know, they should express what they want to do. And, and if you have a good investment partner, they're going to tell you, yeah, we agree or no, we don't think you're good at that. Here's why. And, and you have that conversation before the money goes in. Yes. Very important. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and and, and then, then be prepared to be surprised. John and I worked on a very successful deal together in the antiviral space. And the science researcher from Duke wound up in senior management. To his surprise and ours. Yeah. After, after several false starts with, with the predecessors. <laughs> yeah, you can be uh, happily surprised on that. Um, and then uh, getting to the question uh, about, uh, you mentioned, Jesse, and um, any of you can pipe in on this, but um, you mentioned a blockbuster, a drug with block, blockbuster potential will trump stage any time. So, um, how do you know it has blockbuster potential? If I'm a researcher and, uh, you know, I do discovery, I don't know. Yeah, that's, that, that's the $64 question, isn't it, right? <laughs> how, do you recognize, how do you recognize CRISPR before it's CRISPR? Exactly. But think about um, RNA therapeutics, right? I mean, how long was Alnylam a company, a public company, actually, before they got their first drug uh, into the market? I think more than 20 years. But the interesting question, I think, for uh, the investors that stood behind that company at the time was, really, did they have that level of foresight to recognize that this was going to succeed? Or were they taking a punt to add to their portfolio on something that, if it would work, was clearly going to have, uh, you know, a dramatic impact in medicine. And um, sometimes it takes, you know, that long for the bet to come true or not. How should they manage the dynamic between, I think I have uh, something with blockbuster potential, because I know that's what I've heard. That's what they want to hear. That's what we need. And they'll take me more readily if I say that. And yet I've got to target the application, target the application, always target the application, be reasonable. Uh, does anybody want to enlighten us on how they can do that? Yeah, it's the, it's the challenge of being 
um, dedicated and never giving up. And um, let me give, give you kind of two stories around that concept, which is, I'm not sure it's going to answer the question, but I want to tell the stories. We like stories. So um, one thing I say a lot when I'm giving talks about biotech investing is that biotech venture investing is a very, very different activity than investing in, oh, social media or other types of startups. And what I mean by that is this. When um, FedEx came in to the venture community, when before it was founded, before it was financed, and they said, invest in us because we have this overnight delivery service. The venture investors looked at that and said, overnight delivery service, who needs that? Nobody's doing that. And it took intuition and judgment and great courage to make the bet that if you founded that company, a market would be created. I say there's very little of that kind of judgment call made by institutional biotech investors. Hey, if you walk in and this cancer cure cures cancer, you don't have to do market research. If one of Harrington's researchers cures Alzheimer's, you don't have to do market research. The market will be there. But the judgment comes in figuring out, do you have a blockbuster in the making or not? Awesome. And, and, when, and when we look at an opportunity, you know, we take the point of view that everything we invest in is going to be a home run for us, knowing full well that we're not always going to fulfill that dream. Mm. Um, you know, so we're, we're, we're trying to, the judgments we're trying to make are from our own experience and from looking at what we've seen and heard from the inventors or the company in, in these cases, that is compelling. You know, they've, they've got the sort of, you know, they got a good, strong rationale. You can see they can get there and if they can get there, it's going to make a difference. And we try to judge the risks of getting there. Yeah. It's part of how we look at all the projects at the IAB when they come in. What's the risk that they're going to get to this next step with what they're proposing to do? I love that you uh, consider all uh, projects, investments to be blockbuster potential. I think that's great. Keeps things exciting. It's what makes uh, well, the ones that we put again. money in. We see a lot more. We don't consider them that, uh, or, I, or I, they're not as good as you know. That that's part of the process. I understand. I got a couple questions from the audience. Thank you to the audience. They are asking some awesome questions. So. Um, here is one, which is, um, do you think that the sweet spot for Harrington is more in the rare disease, rare disease space than it is for a target like PCSK9? In, in cholesterol. Uh, who wants to answer that? Uh, we, we've kind of emphasized rare diseases more recently, but I don't know that, uh, speaking, speaking personally here, you know, if somebody had a brilliant breakthrough idea for PCSK9, which overcame the issues with current drugs, you know, maybe it has potential. But we're, we tend to be interested in novel therapies where there is no treatment, where there's a vast need. And I don't know how much PCSK9 drugs need to be improved. So that's maybe how I would think about that. Yeah. Anything that's disruptive in treating patients, meaning you've introduced a new medical treatment that's either curative or at least alleviates symptoms when that patient had nothing else to turn to. That's fair game, whether it's an orphan disease or a mainstream disease. And I think there are opportunities within mainstream diseases for treating subsections of the population, okay? So today we look at, I'm just gonna pick a random example that, that, that that I think is a real example, actually, hypertension. Uh, you know, in, in 50 years ago, we thought it was just high blood pressure. Turns out that there are multiple distinct populations of hypertensive, and each one needs its own sort of tailor-made therapeutic approach. I think we're going to see more and more of that uh, within large-scale diseases, chronic, chronic disease indications. Cancer is clearly one of those. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I don't think there is a simple answer to that question other than, look, just just give us as much supporting evidence as you can that you can you can do something that today we can't do. Yeah, you mentioned um, 
disruptive uh, in terms of the the you know disruptive innovation type of thing the uh, in a good way. <laughs> Um, so uh, what if something's more sort of integrative? It's, um, it's repurposed. It is uh, assisting um, uh, existing uh, drugs in some way. It's complementing them. We've talked about blockbuster and disruptive, but what about that? I mean, that's similar to the rare disease idea, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, the market may be smaller, but... Um... Jesse has an answer for that. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I do want to point out to the listeners that... Um, the Harrington Investment Advisory Board and any other um, uh, backer that you talk to will really appreciate a very crisp delineation of what the pathway forward is and what the milestones that you have to demonstrate are to reduce risk. Um, and that's a useful phrase, actually, to reduce risk. Um, so repurposed uh, drugs, uh, that's... Um, Harks, harps back to the remark I made about the fad characteristic of venture investing and the fad characteristic of pharma. There was a period of time when a lot of venture investors in biotech thought it was a really clever idea to take old drugs and repurpose them for new indications because, gee whiz, you didn't have to go through the original safety trials and everything like that. Um, and... Um, a lot of money was invested. Then the wheel turned and pharma soured on the idea of a, uh, an asset, a drug property, whose intellectual property, the patents weren't on the original molecule. It was a use patent. And the geniuses at Big Pharma said, oh, use patents, they're hard to defend. And that whole field just fell on its face. Yeah, hey, we have some geniuses from Big Pharma on our panel, so <laughs> now, now. <laughs> um, hey, we have another question, which is, um, uh, well, it's about the ecosystem. So this is a great question from our audience, from Jeff. Thinking about the whole ecosystem involving academia, startups, industry, financial organizations, how could things be improved to be more efficient? I'm going to ask uh, John to solve for that X for us. <laughs> Actively improved. <laughs> this is an inherently inefficient process that we try to make efficient. You know, it's it's it it part of it is trying to get comfortable with the level of risk we're undertaking in any project or any investment we make. Um, you know, there every step of the way probably could use some continuous improvement somewhere. The, the the question is, does somebody have an algorithm that can they can apply to that? It's 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 difficult. I don't think about it. I just try and find to get the best opportunity to get ahead of other people. Um, and, you know, so I try to make, be quick in decision-making, you know, get, get enough information to make a, a, a reasonable decision to make an investment and, and not, uh, you know, do diligence forever. Um, but that's, you know, in, in my world, you know, be in the ecosystem beyond, you know, the, the, the complaint is always the FDA, they're slow and so forth, but, you know, they're part of it. And they have improved the quality of products that come out the other end by being rigorous. Um, and then there's reimbursement, which is a black box. So a lot of a lot of the system systemic problems are, you know, beyond the creation of the medicine. It's actually getting it into into commerce and into patients. Jesse, you've uh, you're currently trying to uh, fix climate change. So how about um, fixing the uh, ecosystem? in drug development. Do you have any big ideas for what needs to be done to-, to... Well, I'm, I'm sitting here um, thinking about how actually marvelous it is to think about the amount of working capital being put into early stage research aimed at new medicines. It's phenomenal. And it's a, it's a very strange ecosystem, isn't it? Because as we said before, these are originally academic projects. So without the institutional investment process pouring billions of dollars into drug development, what would happen? We would depend on the NIH and other government agencies and very frankly, speaking from the fusion energy research standpoint, which is my focus in climate change, it hasn't 
reached the point where there are uh, a large number of venture investors investing in research for fusion energy. It's almost all government money, and it's struggling financially, even though the need is very, very real and the potential is enormous. I will say that in fusion R&D, because of one early success in fundraising, a company called Commonwealth Energy Systems, Com Commonwealth Fusion Systems, in, it was a spin out from MIT that was funded with big name capital. The doors have now opened and last year, there's been a total of $4 billion of private money flowing into fusion. So the biotech folks should not look over the fence and think the grass is greener in climate change. It's the other way around. It's the biotech arena that's created the ecosystem, and it's pretty darn good. Yeah. That's a that's a good. Uh, I like that last line. Pretty darn good. Um, but uh, Becca, I think there is something that in that question that speaks directly to the value that Harrington brings at this early stage, and that is total transparency with an applicant for for funding with regard to the proposition they're making. Meaning, you know, our our objective is not to pass or fail uh, a proposal. It is to assess that proposal in terms of its real viability. And very often we will look at an opportunity and say, look, this isn't ready for funding today, but if you can address these vital components and come back to us, then we'll take another look. And we've already internally agreed that if they truly can address these issues, then it's probably a good prospect for funding. So the part of the answer to this question is, Understanding that when you approach uh, anyone for funding, actually, humility is not a bad thing. And what I mean by that is be receptive to the input of people who really have your interests at stake. I, I can honestly say that in, in my experiences, either out of pharma or in corporate venture, we've, um, we've probably not been so good at doing that. In Harrington, the difference here is that you know, we we have no other axe to grind other than ensuring that every proposition comes that comes along, it has the, the best chance of success. And by the way, what we're doing is establishing a sense of a, a set of benchmarks for every other application that comes along behind. It will look at what's been approved, and it will use that as a benchmark for okay, I understand what it is I've got to deliver to get that funding. So it's an iterative process. It's complex. It requires, you know, the input from a diversity of, of experiences. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it requires, um, I think, adaptability and, and, and uh, transparency of the proposer to hear that input and, and adjust accordingly. Sure. Thank you. That's uh, very helpful. I am being told that we are nearing the end of our session, gentlemen. I'm going to ask one question, and I'd like to ask our uh, chairman of our IAB to answer that question, and then we will uh, bid adieu. Um, so, uh, John Rice, um, are the projects, so first of all, I want to do a big shout out to uh, Diana Wetmore and her team, the ther therapeutic development team, but my question is, um, are the projects that you see on the IAB, are they packaged up and communicated um, better than those you might see from similar stage uh, projects? Um, and and what just in brief in brief what specifically if so uh, and hopefully the answer is yes but what is what is better um, that, and then we will say goodbye by by and large yes they are because they have the benefit of the experience of the TDT helping guide it so it's the TDT that brings those projects to us so they've put them in a format that they know uh, is appropriate for getting future funding and kind of what we've tried to give them guidance on what we're looking for so 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 the answer is yes. Um, and and we continue to try and improve that, you know. And we and and so over over the I don't know ten years we've been doing this now, you know, we've gotten a, a lot better at this. But you know, I don't I don't generally see projects that are at this stage as well articulated as they come to us at the IAB. And and I and I try to 
provide that guidance back to people I'm talking to with my other hat on as a venture capitalist at Cincy that I can say, look, you need to have this kind of input, you know, and here's some people you should go talk to. Awesome. And I encourage them all to apply to Harrington, but it's, you know, you know, not all of them, but some of them. We're going to end on the note of they set the standard and thank you gentlemen. And uh, I think we let somebody else take it from here, but thank you very much. Have a great day. And uh, thanks to everybody for letting us lead this panel. Thanks, Becca. Thanks, Becca.